here, Lord. We just do thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. And as Pastor mentioned, Lord, not all is well out in the world, Lord. You know, there's war and suffering, persecution, Lord, strife. And here we are, Lord, on the first Wednesday of uh, the month of March in 2022. And we've come in to seek refuge under your wings, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you just fill us to overflowing, Lord, and that you would just teach us and meet us here, Lord, as we put down our burdens, Lord, at your feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are the great caretaker, Lord, and the peacemaker. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today is Lent, as Pastor mentioned, or the first day of, of Lent. Anybody know where the word Lent comes from? Hi, Mercedes. Great to see you. Latin word is quadragiuma, which means 40th, right? So that's where... That's where the word Lent actually comes from. And the <clears throat> internet definition, if you excuse me, I'm going to read the internet definition of Lent, is a solemn religious observance in the Christian liturgical cal calendar commemorating the 40 days Jesus spent fasting in the desert according to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke before beginning his public ministry during which he, he endured temptation by Satan. This season is observed in the Anglican, Eastern Orthodox, Lutheran, Methodist, Moravian, Oriental Orthodox, Reformed, including Presbyterian and Congregationalists, United Protestant and Roman Catholic churches. Some Anabaptist, Baptist, and non-denominational church, uh, Christian churches also observe Lent. That's quite a list, isn't it? And uh, I, I don't have a uh, background in a church that is liturgical. Like, say, like, I know a lot of y'all have a background in the Catholic Church, right? Um, it's a liturgical church. Follows the liturgy uh, set upon by the head of the denominations and, and so on and so forth, right? And, and the calendar. But we have to remember that just because you may think of something as being Catholic, right? Because that's what, I don't know, I don't know about you, but when I think of Lent, that's what I think, first thing that pops in my head. Oh, that's Catholic, right? Um, it's not. And, you know, we're not to let that be you know, a, a stumbling bl um, block for us. That's what I was trying to say, right? And just like many churches observe the Advent season, which is what the four weeks leading up to Christmas, right? Um, we are going to observe the 40 days leading up to the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, let's see. As Pastor mentioned, it's typic typically uh, the uh, participants give up something. What's the most common item that most people give up, they say, in Lent? I'm giving up chocolate, right? And that was what I always heard, right? But, you know, a pleasure or, or something that, that you really enjoy. And uh, why? Because the Lord wants you to suffer? You know, well, I mean, you know, I have heard it said, well, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, right? So we need to, you know bring upon that, that thing upon us that's going to tempt us to eat the chocolate for 40 days. And, you know, again, I think that's more of a, a liturgical type works based churches, if you get what I mean. Right. And as pastor mentioned, this is not, it's not law. It's not meant to be something that's legalistic in your life. Right. Now, whether or not you choose to actually participate in Lent, I do want to point out, you know what? Maybe we should be participating in a, a Lent-like giving up something for the Lord 365 days a year, not just 40 days a year, right? Uh, so let's take a look at, just as a background, and we will weave this into tonight's communion, okay? So let's go to Mark chapter 1. And as that definition listed, the Gospels of Mark, 
um, Matthew and Luke all have accounts of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Now, Mark chapter 1, in verse, starting in verse 12. Now, Mark's account of this is the shortest, two verses. Immediately, the Spirit drove him, Jesus, into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Boom, boom. That's it. All right? Now, if we turn to Matthew chapter 4, so go to the left. You know what one of the nightmares for anybody that's going to stand up in front of somebody or a, a group of people to share something? So like, you know, I have a nightmare that I'm standing before you and then I tell you to turn to a passage and I can't find it in my Bible. Who took Matthew out of my Bible? <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 4, this is, uh, verse 1. And I'll just read the first two verses there. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And, he, uh, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. All right, now keep your finger there and flip over to Luke chapter 4. They made it easy for us to remember Matthew and, and Luke. It's the same chapter. So Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward when, afterward when they had ended, he was hungry. So with those three accounts there, what similarities do you notice? Temptation, hunger, okay. Wilderness, 40 days, led by the Spirit, right? All important things to, to notice, right? The Spirit, uh, Mark says the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and Matthew and Luke say he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, and, you know, and the point there to, t to take is, you know what? When you try to do anything in your flesh, you're going to profit from it. We, we want to be spirit-led, right? And so being led by the spirit, Jesus is, you know, guaranteed. He's covered by the Holy Spirit. What are, he's in the will of God. And, you know, we need to make sure that whatever we choose to do, whether it's for God or has really nothing to, you know, to do with God, like maybe it's paying your taxes, right? But everything has to, be, to do with God, right? But if you're doing things in the will of God, you're going to be under his protection. Uh, let's see. All right, and we're going to just continue on in uh, Luke's narrative. There are some other differences between Luke and Mark, right? But uh, I was trying to keep this more devotional, and not necessarily a, a deep study, but it would be a good study to kind of go in and note the differences between uh, Matthew and, and Luke. Like, for example, I'll tell you, they, they have the same three temptations, right? But the last two are switched. And there's a reason for that. It would be a good study. All right, Luke, um, we're in Luke 4, starting in verse 3 now. And the devil said to him, to Jesus... If you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. All right? Now we know there's another man coming 
who will gladly accept the offer of Satan, right? To receive his power and glory. Verse 9, then he brought him, Jesus, to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Kind of like for foreboding, you know, <laughs> tone there, right? <laughs> you know, uh, Matthew ends um, his account by saying, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him, right? So just, you know, slightly different there. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we think to ourselves, oh, Jesus doesn't understand what I'm going through, right? He's, he's God, and, and, you know, this reminds us uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the writer of Hebrews says and tells us, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And, you know, we have three temptations here listed, but the text kind of infers that for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was being tempted. Because... Uh, doesn't say that when the devil had finished these three temptations, it says every temptation here in the, in the account of Luke. So possibly, we don't know, doesn't say, right? But Jesus could have been tempted many, many more times than, than these three that are listed here for us. So Jesus being tempted all points as we are. He, he was tempted and did not sin. Okay, so... Let's take a look at these three responses and see how um, or, or what it means for us, okay? So the first response Jesus gave to the temptation, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The second answer was, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And the third response from Jesus was, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. All right, so the first one, that's got to be an easy one for us to understand, right? Be in the word, obey the word, all right? And if you have not learned anything from this pulpit over the years, okay, that is probably at the, at the top of the list, right? We are to be in the word, to know the word, and then obey it, follow it, all right? For the second response, you know, we're to worship Jesus and to serve him. And we need to be careful that we don't get caught up in these movements and causes. And they may be good ones, right? But they pull us away from our worship and service to Jesus, right? Uh, it, it, I am, I'm not very good at saying no, am I, Pastor? I, <laughs> if somebody says, Darren could do that, I, then I'll do it, right? And I find myself doing probably too many things that are in my own strength and they're not led of the Lord because of that. That's something I need to take to heart. I, I need to, uh, uh, you know, to do better there, right? And the other thing is too, you know what? We aren't to worship our pastors and our spiritual leaders, are we? You know, even if they're wonderful and great, right? We can look up to them. We can give them the respect that, that is due to them, right? But we're not to worship. I remember when I was a baby Christian, and um, the first pastor that really t took an interest in my life was Bob Wright. He was a youth pastor at Calvary Chapel uh, of the Finger Lakes. And, um, and I just, he was a very charismatic guy, right? Um, and uh, I just worshiped the ground he worked on, you know. I found out later some of the things that, you know, but... You know, 
There's people in their lives that really do just, imp- you know, impart the word of God to us. We can, we can place them on this pedestal that's too high, turn them into an idol. And we, we don't want that. And we don't certainly want any personality cults, all right? How many times have you gone home to share with family members or friends or other people and you spend more time talking about what the pastor said than what the Lord said, right? So check. We just need to check ourselves there, right? And the third one, and this is the big one for me, uh, we aren't to tempt God. Jesus was uh, quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Where's Massa? In the wilderness, right? And that account is found in Exodus 17. And this is where the people were complaining to Moses. Oh, we're tired. We're thirsty. What did you bring us here, right? Um, And so God instructs Moses to strike the rock. And now came forth water, right? And it's the first time that, that Moses was... Uh, commanded to uh, bring water forth from the rock, right? The second time he was told not to strike the rock, right? And he did out of anger and, and he, was, he was disciplined, correct? Yeah, he was told to speak to the rock. But in this, this is the first case, to strike the rock. Um, Exodus 17, 7, and so he called the name of the place Massa, a place of testing temptation. That's what Massa means. And Meribah which means a place of quarreling, provocation, and strife, right? So Jesus is quoting that that account there. You're not to tempt the Lord your God. Um, Now, this is kind of interesting, and maybe I'm kind of, you know, turning things my way here, so so bear with me, but uh, Malachi 3. When I say Malachi 3, what kind of... what pops into your head? Tithing. Wow, you are well taught. <laughs> so in this section, verses 16 through 15 of Malachi 3, it does talk about tithing. And what's, what is the um, accusation made against the people? What are they doing? Robbing God, right? Verse 15 in this section here um, talks about, it says... Um, it is use, they, the people are saying it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinances, but yet the wicked go unpunished, right? The wicked tempt God and go free is what they're saying. And, and I'm just kind of putting two and two to get together here that the fact that my Bible has that verse 15 in the section of robbing God Are we tempting God when we do not honor him with our tithes? So that could be a check. And then uh, thirdly, and and the last one I want to bring up, another area that I see the Western church especially tempting God in is the idea of hyper grace. All right. Hyper grace uh, is a teaching that emphasizes the grace of God to the exclusion of of other vital teachings such as repentance and confession of sin, right? Uh, it allows us to pervert God's grace and, and believe that we have a license to sin. Um, inter- this, interestingly, Jude 1.4 talks about how certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness. And that's what the, we're doing, not we, but the church, Chris and Dumb, uh, is doing. We are ch- turning the grace of God into lewdness, thinking I can live like a, a wretch and then enter heaven when it's my time to either go home or, or the end comes, right? Um, so, so the three areas I was covering about tempting God was murmuring and complaining. None, we don't have that here, right? No, nobody murmurs or complains, right? Not giving God what is his. And then, or living like the world and proclaiming or presuming on God's grace. And we're, that's, 
how we tempt God um, today. So if I hit any nerves with this, not with this group, right? I'm sure, right? But I know I hit some of my own nerves as I was preparing for this because I got many other little things written down that I'm not sharing with you that were, uh, <laughs> check, Darren, yep, you know. Uh, so, now keep all that in mind as we now turn to communion. And so let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11. Starting in uh, verse 23. Now verses 23 through 26, I'm sure all of us here are pretty familiar with, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim or speak of or teach of the Lord's death till he comes, right? So to be clear, we are memorializing Christ's death, right? We're not recreating it as, as another religious institution does, right? No hocus pocus here. But like, um, who here uh, never reads the instruction manual, right? Or, or you read it, but only as you're doing it, right? And then you finish step 77, right? And then you get to 79 and it says, oh, but back on step 20, if this was true, then don't do this. And you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And what do they always say at the beginning of the instruction manual? Read all these first, right, before you even begin, right? So. <laughs> but how many, how many believers stop at verse 26? Because isn't that communion? Breaking of the bread, drink, you know, receiving the cup, right? Starting in verse 27, this is where... Uh, some important details are given us. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Right? Therefore... Yep. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you. Okay. Um, what are the two things that jumped out at you from this uh, further instructions on taking communion? Let a man examine himself, right? And it'd be better for you to judge yourself than to let the Lord chasten you, right? Who would you rather be judged by? Yourself, right? You're going to be a little bit easier on yourself, aren't you? And it's so much better to realize on your own where you've come short and address it. I mean, not only can you do it personally, right? But just you and the Lord. And the Lord already knows. It's really you coming to understand what he already knows about you, right? Who wants to be judged in public? Nobody, all right? And uh, when the Lord does chasten, all right? And what's another word for chasten? Discipline, Discipline right? Um, you know, we're, we're told in Hebrews 12, 
starting in verse five. Um, and the writer of Hebrews is actually quoting Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. Uh, when he says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. And I only read that just, just to point out to you that if you miss your self-judgment, right, and the, and the Lord still has to chasten you, he's going to do it as a loving father. He's not going to be judging you unto destruction, right? Um, now, over the past few weeks, our pastor has been talking about this shadow man or shadow woman in your life. All right, and the shadow person or persona is who you really are. And we have a public persona, which a lot of times people spend a lot of money to get their personal persona, or maybe for you younger folks, your profile, right? The right picture put up, the right verbiage put in your profile that make you look good, right? Um, who here receives uh, resumes from people, right? When you're hiring somebody and you get a resume from somebody, right? Has, man, they look so good on paper, don't they, right? And that's, and that's what we do with our personal persona. We make ourselves look very spiritual and, and upstanding. And Darren would never do that because that's all I've allowed you to see was my per, you know, personal persona. But there's that other persona that we, you know, that, that's lurking in the shadows there, that, that that's really who we are. And, and you know it, the Lord knows it, and then maybe those that are really close to you um, know the shadow persona. But there's a third persona that we need to be aware of as well, and that's Christ's persona. You know, Pastor talks about lining our, our shadow to our, and our public together, right? Making sure, right? But, you know, they still may be off. Right? We're, we're moving towards that perfection, being uh, turned into the image of, of Christ. And what is that in 2 Corinthians 3.18, right? It tells us that the Holy Spirit is just uh, transforming us into that same image. So, we, so that's all part of this examining of ourselves before we go to the Lord in communion, you know? My transparent. That's the, oh man, it makes life so easier if you are transparent with everybody and you live an honest life, you say what you mean. Now, you know, you have to have tact and you have to do things in love, right? You know, you may be thinking you're going to tell somebody one thing, but, you know, be nice, right? But, you know, the way that you behave in public is really who you are. That just makes things so much easier. And then when the Lord says, hey, Darren, you know what? Hey, good, good job, right? But you know what? I'm going to peel that next layer of that onion of your life off. Because you think you've arrived. You think you've, you know, you're, you're there. Let me show you. <laughs> Pride comes before a fall, right? And the Lord rips that next layer off of that onion, and you're like, ugh, that's a that's a stinky part of the onion, right? You know? Hmm. So, that, uh, that a man examine himself and make sure you judge yourself. Let's heed, make sure we heed uh, those commandments. So, we're going to turn to communion now. And, uh, Time, there's a time warp up here. Uh, you know, we've got to have that investigated, Pastor. Um, so before we partake, let's spend as much time as you need. I, I know it's almost 10 of 8 already, you know. But if you're, if you're new here, who here has never per participated in communion with us on a first Wednesday? Okay, great. So everybody here knows how we do it, right? We don't pass the elements around, so you're not 
feel like you're forced to have to take it. Um, you need to sit there and hopefully even before you walk through the doors today, you've been in preparation for this evening, right? But be in prayer. Ask the Lord, where, where am I lining up, right? Examine yourself if you, if you still need to, right? And, and as the warning says, if there's too much disparity between, you know, those, those personas, right? Maybe you shouldn't take communion tonight. Maybe you do need to get some things settled with the Lord. And obviously, if, if you find yourself, you know, there, um, you know, just know there's uh, pastors here and elders here and uh, the church would be more than happy to, to meet with you, to pray with you, um, or find somebody who's just spiritually more mature than you are that, can, that you can trust, you know, to lead you in the word. And, and to get that worked out, right? It's very, very, very important. Um, so that's, that's all I have to share on that. And so let's go to the word, uh, Lord in prayer. And uh, we'll dim the lights, put some uh, instrumental music on, and uh, we'll partake. Father, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you that you're a loving Father. We thank you that even when you chasten us, it is in love for our well-being, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to examine ourselves, Lord. Are there things we do need to give up, Lord, whether it's for 40 days of Lent or 365 days forever, Lord? Things, people, habits, a little precious that pastor talks about, Lord. And Lord, we may not even know that it's harming us or holding us back. Open our eyes to see, Lord. Work in each of us, Lord, to be transformed into your image day by day, moment by moment, Lord. We know we won't reach uh, perfection this side of eternity, but Lord, we don't want to stay where we are. We want you to change us, please, Lord. So Father, again, we come before you, we humbly come before you, Lord. Bow our hearts and our heads, our knees, Lord, to you and offer ourselves to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.